This fourth presentation is on human freedom. Human freedom. Now, the last hour we talked about the truth. Remember, the truth is the proper object for the intellect. And now we're going to talk about human freedom, authentic human freedom. Uh, at the outset of this fourth lecture, it's very essential to recognize that authentic human freedom and truth are indissolubly bound up. There is no authentic freedom apart from the truth. Freedom and truth go together. You cannot have authentic hu human freedom divorced from truth. God willed that man should be left in the hand of his own counsel. The book of Sirach says, one of the wisdom books in the Bible. God willed that man should be left in the hand of his own counsel, so that he might of his own accord seek his creator and freely attain his full and blessed perfection by cleaving to him. That's a statement from the document Gaudium et Spes from the Second Vatican Council. The Catechism of the Catholic Church uh, addresses human freedom in several key paragraphs. One of them is paragraph 1741, Liberation and Salvation. By his glorious cross, Christ has won salvation for all men. He redeemed them from the sin that held them in bondage. For freedom, Christ has set us free. In him, we have communion with the truth that makes us free. The Holy Spirit have been, has been given to us, and as the Apostle teaches, where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Already, we glory in the freedom of the children of God. And those were several quotes uh, from the New Testament that I gave you in succession there. So freedom and truth are indissolubly connected. No authentic human freedom outside of the truth. Now a note on this, uh, a, a clarification, definition. There is an enormous error uh, it is a, uh, perhaps a subliminal kind of an error, an error in the subconscious perhaps, but there is a false premise in society today that freedom, now definitions of words are very important. Uh, most people would think that freedom is the ability to do whatever you want to do. You know, it's a free country, I can do whatever I want. I can do this, that, the other thing. That's false. Absolutely false. Freedom is not being able to do whatever you want to do. That's not authentic human freedom. Being able to do whatever you want to do may indeed cross the line from freedom into license. And it is very, very important to know the difference between freedom and license. We live in a free country, but that doesn't mean you can do whatever you want to do. Uh, we've crossed that line and begun to suffer from it. When you abuse freedom, you lose freedom. When you abuse freedom, you lose freedom. The abuse of freedom I'm talking about is license where you cross over the line from what is acceptable in the realm of authentic human freedom and you go into what we would call license, licentious behavior. Some illustrations help. We say we live in a free country and I say that's right, we're in a free country, we're free. I gotta be free, I gotta be me, and my truck is getting old. Therefore, 
I'm going to go out in the parking lot and find the best four-wheel drive truck I can. I'm going to drive it back to Montana. It's a free country. <laughs> right? Free country. If freedom means doing whatever you want to do, I'd steal your truck. And you say, wait a minute, that's not freedom. Right, it's not. That's license. That, I, I know it's not rocket science, but that underlying false premise gives rise to a host of evils. Uh, some example of those evils. Under the specious pretext of freedom of expression, pornography becomes legal. Believe me, when the law of the land says pornography is okay, that undermines law. And that is not freedom, that is license. And it is destructive. And it leads to the loss of freedom. The man who sins, Jesus Christ says, the man who sins becomes the slave of sin. And I'm here to tell you that millions of people in this country and other countries are slaves. They're slaves. Pornography, just to use an example, pornography is every bit as addictive as heroin and just as destructive. Oh, it destroys families, destroys relationships, destroys marriages. It'll destroy the country. You let it go on and up. Do you know what the word pornography means? I, 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 tell, I say this to people all over the country, and, and it always gets a, a, a reaction. Words are important. It is good to know what words actually mean. Now that word pornography is made up of two Greek words. The first, pornoi. The second, graphia. Ponaroi, the devil. Graphia, pictures. Literal definition, pornography, the devil's pictures. That's the exact and literal translation of it. And that's exactly what it is. You mess with the devil, you end up enslaved to the devil. And he's a cruel master. He will destroy your marriage and your life. He will rot the very fabric of your humanity and reduce you to garbage if you let him. If you let him. Don't let him. Now, you see, that's an example of, of dull-witted people. That, that's an example of legislators or judges who don't know what freedom is. They don't apparently understand the difference between freedom and license. They cross the line, and they're now contributing to the loss of freedom among millions of human beings. Abortion. Oh, well, this is a free country. I have a right to choose. Indeed, you have a free will, you say. Therefore, you have a right to choose. It's the only case in all of language that I know of where they don't finish the sentence. A right to choose what? You know, think, what are you saying? I have a right to choose to kill my child? Are you out of your mind? You must be. You must be insane. And the politicians and judges who facilitate it, enable it, fund it, and confirm it, are equally out of their moral, rational mind. They have lost it. That's not freedom. That is license. Use your basic common sense. You know, I, I, I was in a discussion with a radical feminist one time. That was an event. <laughs> and at one point, I said to her, well, what do you think it is in the womb? And at that point, she, I had had about six questions she couldn't answer. They, ne they really never can. They think they're intellectual, but they're not. They're emotional. And their argument is never intellectual. It's always emotional. 
I said, what do you think it is in the womb? And the truth came out of her mouth for the first time. Whatever I say it is. What, what is it in the womb? Whatever I say it is. And, and, and it's, if it's going to live or die, whatever I say. In other words, I'm God. I'll decide if it li lives or dies. Planned Parenthood now admits that it's a human being in the womb. But they say the mother has the right to kill it. They've gone that far. Murder! They even go so far to elevate it to the status of a spiritual act. Oh yeah, some senior officials in Planned Parenthood have said it's a woman's spiritual right to do away with the child. Many years ago, Archbishop Fulton Sheen was on an airplane during Lent, flying to do a mission. And the flight attendant brought lunch, and Bishop Sheen said, ah, I think I won't take lunch today. It's Friday, Lent. I could do a little fasting. So the, there was a very nice looking young lady sitting next to him. She said, I won't take lunch either. And I said, oh, are you Catholic as well, fasting for Lent? She said no. In an incredible moment of clarity and truth, she said no. I'm a witch fasting for abortions. And in the next two hours, she went on to tell him things that he never forgot about the battle between good and evil. And how in that battle God permits things that we would never imagine that he could possibly permit. Why would God ever permit horrible evil? To bring a greater good out of it. That, that's why. And, and if you want to know about that, I wrote a doctoral thesis on that subject. Look right there in a crucifix. That's a paradox. Not a contradiction, it's a paradox. The greatest evil and the greatest good. The greatest evil deicide. Creatures murder the Creator. Jesus is the word through whom the universe was created. They nailed him to a cross and killed him. And yet it's the greatest good, the good of redemption. That's, that's a paradox. Why? Did God our Father permit that? Absolutely. He, he did. He willed it. Why? To bring a greater good out of it. What's the greater good? Redemption. Now, in this life, we often can't see the greater good. 9-11. When that happened, I, I, I was shocked, but not surprised. I'd been talking about things like that for years, basically saying it's going to happen, it's got to happen. God will have to apologize to Sodom and Gomorrah if something doesn't happen, in plain English. So when that happened, I was not surprised. Oh, shocked, outraged, but not surprised. And let me tell you something, as clearly as I can, in as unvarnished a way as I can, in your face, truth, as I can. If we don't wake up, morally speaking, if we don't straighten out, morally speaking, if we don't do something relatively fast to get rid of this incredible crime against humanity, called abortion and partial birth abortion, 9-11 will look like a picnic in the park compared to what's coming. Because a dirty bomb in the middle of Manhattan is child's play with today's technology. I have a lot of friends in the anti-terrorism task force all around the country and there have been things that if you knew these things, I'll tell you what, if the general population knew what's gone on in the last five years and how many serious plots have been disrupted, well, I'll tell you one, out in Los Angeles, at LAX, you know, Los Angeles International Airport, out on one of the far off runways, they found the original crating of a, of a Scud missile and burn marks on the runway. They had attempted to fire them. Now, that's a surface-to-surface -surface missile. That's not a surface-to-air missile. 
That's not used to shoot down a plane, surface to surface. They had pointed it into downtown Los Angeles and attempted to fire it. It misfired. And it was only the grace of God that prevented a, an unbelievable catastrophe. And there are at least a dozen more just like that incidents, you know, near misses. They have dozens of these people that they've caught doing these things. Uh, you say, well, I didn't read about that in the newspaper and hope to God I don't, and you don't either. If we're that stupid to publicize every little thing they do, well, let's just, you know, we'll all be speaking Arabic by, you know, two, three more years. Why is this happening? You reap what you sow. Tens of millions of abortions aren't going to win you God's favor. You know, they, 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 we don't want the Ten Commandments in public places, separation of church and state. That's not what the Founding Fathers said. That is a lie right out of hell. The Founding Fathers wanted separation of church and state in this way. They didn't want a state church. Why? They came from England, you remember, the Church of England. They had one religion, and you better belong to it. They had that experience. No, they didn't want a state-sponsored religion. No, that's bad. We don't want that. They wanted to keep one religion from being the official religion of the country. That doesn't work. And they wanted to keep the state out of the affairs of religion. That's the authentic separation of church and state. They had no intention of evicting God from all public places. And from... It was not their intent. It wasn't their intent to take God out of schools, the Ten Commandments out of public places. Remember that, the, oh, the debate went on, oh, nope, sorry, can't have no, nope, we don't want any praying in schools. Well, by golly, we can invite witches into school and, and, and overt homosexuals into school to discuss their lifestyle, but God help us if you ever let somebody pray in a school. No, we don't want any of that here. Let's keep them out. And so they were screaming about that for years. And then what happened? 9-11 happened. You know, on 9-10, on you can find anybody praying in a school. On 9-11 or 9-12, you couldn't find a school where they weren't praying. And that's a fact. Oh man, the intellect gets darkened and the will gets weakened very quickly. How weak we are. Well, sometimes in plain English, it requires, uh, you know, some people like to take the easy way out. Sometimes people like being stupid. Sometimes they like being ignorant. They know what the truth is, but they don't want to grab onto it because of what it might require. Their will is weak, and so they don't do it. No, we don't want this. No, we don't want that. You know what is better than anything else that I've found for people who have a serious problem of being focused on reality. A good old-fashioned butt kicking. In plain English, they need to get, get their butt kicked up one side and down the other. Believe you me, don't you think God can't do it? And don't you think he won't do it? God chastises every son he loves, the Bible said. So, you know, you're a, you're a rebellious child. You're going to do it your way. You're self-willed. You don't want to listen to the church. You God will kick your butt. Why? Because he loves you. You mean, how could he love me? Uh, how could a butt kicking be a sign of love? Well, uh, there's a lot of parents in this room, and they could give you a long dissertation on the subject. I'll guarantee you. Oh, Uncle Tony. Uncle Tony used to say, some people, they need to get hit between the eyes with a two-by-four just to get their attention. How true that is. 
How true that is. People go their way. Oh, they don't want to listen to the Catholic Church. They leave the church. They give you 101 reasons why they don't like the church. This, that, the other thing. You know, they have, oh, I have intellectual problem. Underlying it all, they usually have a moral problem. It's not in the intellect. Quite often it's in the will. They're weakened in their will. They're going to, that was me for 20 years. I'll tell you what, I did it for 20 years. Every now and then, a, a, a kid in a big city not too long ago, his mama brought him over to me and said, here, talk to father. And, and we talked about two minutes and the kid said, ah, oh, uh, he's too old, he doesn't understand. At that point, I wanted to grab him up by his narrow neck and say, Sonny, I was freebasing cocaine with Ike and Tina Turner before you were a glimmer in your daddy's eye. Don't tell me I don't understand. I've been there and I have done that. And if you mean where is there? Everywhere. And what is that? Just about everything. I have indeed been there and done that. Oh, I understand way better than you think. I understand humanity because I've been to the dark side of the moon. I've been to the pit of evil and I came back alive to tell about it. And I'll tell you, the will gets weak. St. Paul said, for you were called to freedom. You were called to freedom, brothers. Only don't allow your freedom to be a cloak for vice. Another translation as it don't allow your freedom to be an opportunity for the flesh sin or as st. Peter says in his first letter live as free men yet without using your freedom as a pretext for evil you know very often people say that well hey I, I, I'm free I have a free will I can do what I want they use that as a pretext for evil to do sin I'm free man if I want to smoke crack I'm smoking it fine smoke it and watch what happens God will kick your butt so bad through that. Man, these people don't know what they're doing. You, you want to smoke that stuff? I, I'm going to tell you something. I once watched major drug dealers bring in a satanic priest to say a black mass over cocaine to curse it. You know what happens? You know what happens with holy water when we get holy water and the priest blesses it? You say certain prayers over the holy water to bless it. And in the old days, the prayers were exorcism prayer. And wherever that water was placed, an exorcism was brought into being in that location. Same with blessed salt or blessed oil. Well, there is a reverse in the order of evil. And they, they have their prayers. They'll say certain incantations and verses. Usually they read them backwards. Over the material, it's the sacramental principle. You have the words and the material. Holy water, you got the water and the prayer. The Satanists, they got the material. A hundred kilos of cocaine. And they curse it. And you wonder why people not only lose their physical health, but their mind and their soul. That's part of the reason. Oh, I understand. I understand way better than the average human being understands. I understand way better than the average drug dealer understands. The will is, quick, is quickly weakened. There's a mystery, a mystery of this free will business. St. Paul talked about it. We get a lot of our theology from St. Paul. This is a key verse. Listen to this from Romans. Chapter 7, verse 20, or verse 15 through 25. Listen to St. Paul. Uh, sometimes I do not even understand my own actions, for I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. Now, if I do what I do not want to do, I agree that the law, the moral law, must be good. So then it is no longer I that do it, but sin which dwells in me. Now that requires some explanation. That, that's not a way out, you know, to, to shirk responsibility. But so the, the, the key is, 
For uh, although I, 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 I want to do what's right, I find that often I don't do what's right. That's the mystery of free will there at work. Now, as somebody who has been there and done that, I can tell you that a, that a moment can come in, in the life of a soul where the soul is sickened by its own actions. You know, a person can do this, that, or the other sin. They can commit sexual sins. Uh, perhaps they can abuse their bodies with alcohol or with drugs. In a, in, a, in, in a moral way, in an interior way, it sickens them. After a while, they come to hate what they're doing. And ultimately, the vast majority of people doing these things have a death wish. They really do. The vast majority of people who get addicted to cocaine, heroin, at some point, they lose the will to live. I mean, I did. I didn't care. Uh, my mother used to say to me, don't you know you're hurting yourself, you're killing yourself? Don't you know this or that is bad for you? Um, I remember one time mom said to me, I, I don't know what I had done. Uh, one of the, uh, the, the umpteen many things that, that I had done when I was a teenager and, and, and having, you know, used up all the available brooms, broken over my back. She said, doesn't your conscience bother you? And I said, no. And it didn't. Why? I had killed it. I had killed my conscience. Do you know that you can kill your conscience? How do you kill your conscience? You don't listen to it over an extended period of time. Uh, it's kind of like, I grew up in upstate New York, you know, over in Hudson, New York. And uh, now I'm old school, right? I'm from the old days. We walked to school. Man, we didn't take no bus. We walked a mile up there. And you know, in the winter, the wind used to howl off the Hudson River. And of course, being a teenage boy in those days, I, well, it wasn't cool to be, you know, have a hat on or anything. You know, we didn't wear no hats. We were tough and we were too cool. So I'd walk to school and the wind would howl off the Hudson River and my left ear would get frostbitten on the way to school. And about the time I got to my locker, it'd start thawing out. And man, that hurt. That's abuse. You know, I was abusing that my ear. What happened? Well, I abused it one too many times. You abuse it, you lose it. And I have no feeling whatsoever in my left ear. Why? Well, I abused it one too many times. It, it, it no longer had the ability to do what it, it was created. There was no sensitivity in it. You know, I couldn't feel anything. You get your fingers frostbitten one too many times. Now, that's not what your fingers are made for. Not made to get frostbitten or stick them in a fire. You know, what happens? The nerves get killed. Can't feel anything anymore. You abuse your conscience one too many times, it doesn't work anymore. It's dead. It's dead. You can kill your conscience. You can abuse your free will and you can end up a slave. It's a terrible, terrible thing to be caught in the slavery of sin. You get to a point, and maybe some action of grace, you know, maybe you've got a mother praying for you, a grandmother praying for you somewhere, you know, well, you're out there just running amok. You know, you're just doing what you want to do. You know, the battle cry of my generation back in the 60s and 70s, I got to be free, I got to be me. And man, then you go do whatever you want to do. You know, drink, drink another gallon of bourbon and, and, you know, smoke some more dope. And pretty soon, you lose it completely. And you're caught in slavery and you can't get out if you wanted to. Uh, you reach a certain point, I, I, I know of a, well, I know of so many drug addicts. They, they reach a point and, and, a, and an inspiration, a moment of grace comes. Probably a lot of moments of grace. You have a chance 
to turn away from that because it's been making you sick for a long time. Might be pornography. Now I'll guarantee you there's a bunch of people, good as you are, Catholic and Christian as you are, there's a bunch of people in this room addicted to pornography. I'll guarantee you that. I will stake my life on that. And you don't have to go out looking for it, by the way. You don't have to go out looking, oh yeah, you got these adult stores here, there, and everywhere, yeah. That's bad enough. You can get anything you want on the internet. Bad as bad can be. Right there. It's right in the convenience of your own home. Sit there and be destroyed. You don't have to go out shopping for the devil. You know, he's like a lot of drug dealers. You don't have to go out and buy drugs from them. They'll deliver. Yeah, oh yeah. The devil will deliver right to your doorstep. Millions of people are addicted to all kinds of dangerous and destructive things. And at a certain point, it sickens them. Oh, at first they may think it's fun. At first they may rationalize it away. And then you do it for a month and a year and five years and ten years. We have a problem. Out in Montana, I, I live in northwest Montana. It's a nice place to live. Uh, right on the edge of Glacier Park. Very beautiful. Mountains. Magnificent place. Uh, we have very little crime out in Montana. Mainly because the majority of people in Montana are pretty much old school kind of cowboys. Um, we, 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 you know, um, our, our idea of gun control is controlling your breathing when you pull the trigger. Um, you know, they, and, and we have a very low crime rate because of it. If you know, the places that have absurdities like strict gun control, like New York City and Washington, D.C., those places have the highest crime rate. Why? Because the criminals know that the average guy just doesn't have a gun. See, out in Montana, when they rob you or try to, to, to uh, break into your house and they're going to commit murder and rape and mayhem, we just shoot them. It's really easy. It's a no-brainer. We just shoot them, and that keeps the crime rate way down. Way down. And now I know that sounds funny, but it works really well. We have one of the lowest crime rates in the world. You know who has one of the highest crime rates in the world? England and Scotland. Where if a man breaks into your home, not only can you not have a gun, you can't even have certain kinds of knives to defend yourself and step, oh, you have one of them knives that's sharp on both edges. The guy can sue you for his injuries. Now that's stupidity. That's true stupidity. All kinds of threats to freedom. In a key verse in the gospel, Gospel of John, chapter 8, verse 31 and following, Jesus then said to those Jews who had believed in him, If you remain in my word, the truth, you will truly be my disciples. Now, note what he says. If you remain in my word, you will truly be my disciples. And then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. And they answered him, well, we are descendants of Abraham and have never been enslaved to anyone. Man, that was a big lie. What about Egypt? For one thing, and there were a couple other instances too. We are descendants of Abraham, never been enslaved anyway. How can you say you will become free? And Jesus said to them, amen, amen, I say to you, everyone who lives in sin is the slave of sin. A slave does not remain in a household forever, but a son always remains. So if a son sets you free, you are truly free. If you are truly my disciples, you'll abide in my word. That's a condition. In order to be his disciple, you have to abide in his word. In other words, obey his command. Do what he says. Live the way he says to live. Then you're truly his disciple, and then you will know the truth. No, there is a precondition for being able to know what the truth is. Have you ever wondered why so many people just don't get it? 
they haven't met the precondition. They're not abiding, living in, in God's Word. And so what happens? They're absolutely blind to truth. They can't see it. They can look and they can look and they can look and they'll never see it. Why? They are blind. A blind man can't see. Sometimes we get upset. Can't you see it? No, a blind man cannot see. You know, they, they can't hear you talk and talk and talk and talk until you're blue in the faith and you think, man, I gave a quite an articulate exposition of the doctrine of the faith and this guy just don't get it. Why doesn't he get it? He's deaf. He's deaf. Why is he blind? Why is he deaf? And why is he dead? Because he's not abiding in the word of Jesus. And so he doesn't have the truth. He doesn't know the truth. And what happens? He's a, he's a slave. Lives in slavery. I've seen the extreme examples. Now, many of you have too. Many of you have seen it. You go a, one, you go a step too far with sin, and one of the worst consequences of sin is the slavery to sin. It's hard to break away from it. You know, that, that can be sexual sins, that can be drugs, that can be alcohol, that can be stealing things, all kinds of things. And you're enslaved, and after a while, it makes you sick. Gosh, I've had hundreds and hundreds of people tell me how sick they are of their sins. And they want to get away from it. But they have such a difficult time. It's difficult. They can't break free. Man's freedom is limited and fallible. In fact, man has failed. He freely sinned in the beginning. By refusing God's plan of love, man deceived himself and became a slave to sin. I'm reading to you from the Catechism of the Catholic Church, paragraph 1739. By refusing God's plan of love, he deceived himself and became a slave to sin. This first alienation engendered a multitude of others. From its outset, human history attests to the wretchedness and oppression born of the human heart in consequence of the abuse of freedom. That's worth repeating. From its outset, human history attests to the wretchedness and oppression born of the human heart in consequence of the abuse of freedom. If you abuse freedom, you risk losing freedom. The abuse of freedom is sin. And when you abuse freedom and sin, you risk becoming the slave of sin. You guarantee it if you keep it up. Now let me tell you uh, an enormous uh, difference, uh, a very key um, distinction that we should make. Anyone can sin, okay? We know that. Anyone can commit a sin. You can sin, I can sin. When, when, when the day comes and you think that somebody, whether it's your wife or your husband or your pastor or me or, or anyone, when you think they're beyond sin, Watch out. Any human being can sin. It's one thing to sin. It's another thing to live in sin. Anybody can fall. We're fallible. We're human. You know, we're weak. We have a fallen nature, the consequence of original sin. So sure, uh, it's possible you can sin. You, you can get angry. You know, uh, I haven't been you know, so angry that I got physical in probably 30 years, you know, uh, thank God, thank God. That would be inappropriate, totally, for me. Uh, but there have been a couple of occasions where I came that close. I mean, and you know, I, I, it could happen. Believe you me, uh, you know, one time at a conference like this, uh, somebody, some guy who, who either was not all there in the head or maybe motivated by the devil somehow, he grabbed me right by the throat in a very violent way and the old me came out. 
oh, it was not good. It was not good. Now, I, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't um, floor him. I didn't choke him. I, you know, some, some people grabbed him, and that was the end of that. But we can sin. I could have sinned. I could have hooked him and, and put him right on the ground. I, I could have done it. I didn't. Thank God I didn't. I'm glad I didn't. But I could have sinned, you know. Anyone can. That's one thing. It's another thing to sin and not repent. And then sin again, and then sin again, and live in sin. That is a profound difference. Sinning and living in sin. When you live in sin, boy, you're asking for it. When you live in sin day in and day out, like millions of people do, where they don't repent, you know, they'll commit sins, sexual sins maybe, you know, sins of violence, they do it and it becomes a habit. And they keep doing it and keep doing it and they get enslaved to it. Then you are open season. The devil is given special permission to exercise authority over you at that point and often does. Uh, people who don't believe this should have been me, with me on many an occasion. Uh, uh, believe me, uh, demonic possession is highly unusual, but demonic obsession is enormously common. And I have seen it in every state, every place I've been, it is very, very common. How does it usually happen? Sin, people sin and sin, and sin and live in sin and never repent and keep going and it's a way of life and they open themselves to all kinds of evil and become enslaved well we've got threats to freedom a lot of a lot of threats to freedom let me read this to you the exercise of freedom does not imply a right to say or do everything it is false to maintain that man the subject of this freedom is an individual who is fully self-sufficient and whose finality is the satisfaction of his own interests in the enjoyment of earthly goods. Uh, that's from the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith on the Freedom of Conscience, number 13. Moreover, the economic, social, political, and cultural conditions that are needed for a just exercise of freedom are all too often disregarded or violated. If we were able to see reality such as it is, the law, for instance, that permits unbridled pornography, if we were able to see how many human beings that hurts, spiritually speaking, uh, how it, it, it hurts their soul and maybe puts them in hell. If we were able to see that, we'd be scared to death. Now, the people in society who facilitate that, who enable that, who promote that, will have much lower places in hell than the people who fall victim to it through weakness. Just like the poor woman who has an abortion, Oh, maybe, maybe, maybe she's uh, just selfish or this or maybe, but maybe she's scared. Maybe she doesn't really know. Maybe she's been pushed by her boyfriend or her family or her husband. I, I, I don't blame her a whole lot. I mean, she shouldn't do it, and uh, you know that's it's a horrible thing. But I don't. She's not in the same category as the public officials who promote it and push it and fund it and drive it and make it an everyday part of life and who become responsible in part for millions of such atrocities against humanity. So there are threats to freedom, no question about it. Uh, and there's, a, you know, there's an association between liberation and salvation by his glorious cross Christ has set us free. He has won salvation for all mankind. Uh, we were in the bondage of sin and Jesus set, his, set us free. Jesus says in the Bible, I have come to set the captives free. 
Now, about a dozen times today, and it happens every place I go, people say, what's that pin that you're wearing uh, on your jacket there, Father? Uh, is that the pin of your religious order or something? And it has Latin writing on it. And so they figure for sure it's a church pin or something. It, 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 it says on here in Latin, de oppresso liber, to free the oppressed. That is the emblem and the, the insignia and the motto of the United States Army Special Forces. to liberate the oppressed. Now that's a highly, now I, obviously I use that in, 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 in a spiritual sense because Jesus said it, I've come to set the captives free. The Army Special Forces motto, to liberate the oppressed. What was Jesus' mission? To liberate the oppressed. What's the mission of the Special Forces? To liberate the oppressed. And if you don't think they're not trying to liberate the oppressed in places like Iraq, you're not in touch with reality. You need to talk to some of my friends over here who, who came back not too long ago from there. I, I mean, you know, we're Americans. And we've always been this way. You know, my grandfather was very proud that he was a sergeant in the United States Army during World War I. And my father was in the Navy during World War II. And some of my cousins were in Korea. And my generation was Vietnam. And after that was the first Gulf War, and then the second war, and then the, there were any number of other places in Eastern Europe, in Africa. Are we trying to conquer the world? No, we're not. De oppresso liber, it's very biblical, it's very Christian, to free the oppressed. If I know that someone like a Hitler or a Saddam Hussein is sawing people's legs off to torture them and to maintain his grip on his power, and I turn my back, I am not Christian. I am a poor excuse. And, and, and we know very well, nobody in their right mind likes war. My grandmother used to say, war is hell. I remember multiple times she'd say that. Because she, she lived through World War I and World War II and Korea and Vietnam, and she said, war is hell, and she's right. No one in their right mind likes war. War is indeed hell. However, you have to acknowledge reality, there is evil in the world. And from time to time in the course of human affairs, evil men rise up, seize power, and inflict horrible outrages on humanity. Hitler was one of them. You know, I, I, what, what, do you we, what do you think the world would be like today if we say, oh, well, we'll just talk to Mr. Hitler. We'll just be nice to him. And he won't bother us. Phew, man, wake up. There is evil in the world. And sometimes it has to be opposed. That's the way it is out in the world and that's the way it is in the spiritual life. The Bible says, the gospel says, the kingdom of heaven is taken by the violent. And don't mean physical violence, but it says that. The kingdom of heaven is taken by the violent and it is indeed the violent who take it. What does it mean by that? It means a kind of spiritual violence, doing violence in the area of the will. In other words, we're attracted to sin. We like to sin. Why? Well, it, it, it's part of our fallen human nature. It's the consequence of original sin. We gravitate towards sin. We, there's, a, there's a tension, a constant battle inside the human heart. We have to fight it out. You know, if you say, oh, there's no evil, like some of these people today. Oh, you know, uh, 
they're not so bad. Saddam Hussein said, oh, he's not so bad. Osama bin Laden, oh, he's not so bad. Uh, you know, on and on and on. There is evil in the world. Wake up. Or you too will be speaking Arabic before long. And I'll tell you what, if you think that's going to be a reign of peace, you are out of your mind. You are out of your mind. Uh, you know, women talk about women's rights. What kind of rights you think you'll have with a radical Islamic view? Uh, you won't have any, none. It'll be back to the dark ages and you'll be property like cattle, ladies. That's what is at stake. And how do you win the war? You win it in here. How are you going to win the war out there? You got to win it in here. You know why we won at World War II? Because the people from that greatest generation were really strong Christian. They were very good. In my hometown, in the, in the parish, we, we had a, a chapel at St. Mary's Parish, Our Lady of Victory. And on the wall was the names of all the men and women that went off to war to defend freedom. And, and so a lot of them had stars next to their name. Those are the ones who got killed in action, who paid the price, and freedom has a price. Out there and in here. Oh, war is a terrible thing, a horrible thing, but not the most horrible of things. Far worse is that reality of people who think nothing is worth fighting for. People who won't stand for anything. People who aren't willing to sacrifice and pay a price for freedom. Oh, that's much worse than war. That decadent, sick reality that exists in so many people today. Nothing is worth a fight. And so it is only through the exertions of far better men and women than, than, than themselves that they are made free, set free, and kept free. That is a reality out there in the secular world, and it is a reality in here in the church. Freedom has a price, and it is only through a lot of blood, sweat, and tears that human freedom is achieved and kept. Life is dour combat with the forces of evil. But if we fight the good fight and run the race to the finish line, we know the last chapter of the book, we win.